Gilbert Keith Chesterton is one of the most sparkling and effervescent figures in the great Catholic tradition. A physically large man with an even larger intellect and imagination, he embodied the wealth and capaciousness of Catholicism. If one is ever tempted to see Catholic Christianity as something cramped, crabby, and puritanical, he should read even one paragraph of Chesterton. The distinctive mark of his style was a love for paradox, the crashing together of opposites which generates unexpected meaning and insight. He also delights in puns, plays on words, surprising reversals, etc. Reading Chesterton is a bit like opening a bottle of champagne, intoxicating, sparkling, and rare. Which words can best describe the Chestertonian take on the world? Joyful, playful, rambunctious, joking, realist, traditionalist, balanced, and sane. Chesterton felt that something had gone dreadfully wrong with the modern world and that classical Christianity would set it right. Chesterton is the only Englishman besides Henry VIII to be declared a defensor fidei, defender of the faith, by the Pope. His writings, speeches, and radio addresses were recognized as powerful antidotes to the prevailing skepticism, materialism, and cynicism of his time. He functions even now as a remarkably effective evangelist, a proclaimer and celebrator of the gospel. Why do you feel like G.K. Chesterton is one of the pivotal players? Well, I think Chesterton, uh, along with Newman, articulated Christianity precisely at a time when it was under great attack. Think of all the critiques coming up out of the Enlightenment, out of modernity, that were uh, casting a shadow over Christianity. Chesterton emerges with great joy and with great clarity, precisely in opposition to these uh, criticisms. And that makes him an evangelist very much for our time. That's why he had such an impact on uh, C.S. Lewis, on Fulton Sheen, on so many others who have evangelized in modern times. I think that's why he's a pivotal player. Gilbert Keith Chesterton was born May the 29th, 1874, here in the Kensington neighborhood of London. His parents were solidly middle class, and though they had their child baptized according to the formularies of the Church of England, their own convictions were Unitarian and progressive. Gilbert was very close to his younger brother, Cecil. Upon his brother's birth, Gilbert remarked, now I shall always have an audience. Once Cecil managed to speak, the two of them argued incessantly but good-naturedly, once sustaining an argument for 18 hours straight. 
One of Gilbert's earliest memories is of a toy theater that his father had assembled. It awakened in him a lifelong interest in theater and drama, and in what we might call serious play. When he was a student at St. Paul's School in London, Chesterton was gawky and tall and not very gifted at sports. His passion for poetry he hid behind a bland facade, hoping not to be noticed. Looking back on his youth, he said that the chief impression he made on his teachers was that he was asleep. His gifts seemed to lie in the artistic direction, and so, upon graduation, he did not proceed, as did most of his colleagues, to Oxford or Cambridge, but rather to the Slade School of Art, which was a constituent part of University College London. All his life long, Chesterton loved to draw, usually in a playful or comic style. At the Slade School, he studied art formally, but it must be said, in a rather desultory way. He attended other lectures at the university, but never achieved a degree. The dominant philosophical attitude at the university was, in Chesterton's own words, very negative and nihilistic. This attitude cast a shadow over his mind and convinced him that the most worthy ideas were on the defensive. But in time, he grew weary of this nihilism. And with the help of writers such as Browning and Stevenson, and especially Walt Whitman, he came to realize that existence itself is something wonderful, something for which we should be grateful. And then he concluded, if we're grateful for existence itself, we have to be grateful to someone. So G.K. Chesterton wasn't a Cambridge, Oxford man. No, it's very interesting. You know, a lot of his contemporaries would have gone to Oxbridge, as they say, Oxford or Cambridge, real establishment places. And Chesterton didn't follow that route. He came here to the Slade School of Art. And there's always been something a little more kind of working class about Chesterton, despite all his sophistication. Um, something a little bit anti-establishment about him. Um, but also the fact that he studied art rather than you know, one of the, let's say, classics at Oxford. Uh, he remains his life long deeply interested in the visual arts, was a doodler and drawer, draftsman all his life, painter. And while he was here, he discovered almost indirectly he had this talent for writing. But see, I think his writing always has a, a painterly quality about it. There's always an artistic uh, draftsman quality, vividly imagined quality to his writing. He would have picked that up here at the Slade School but it sets the tone for a lot of his, you know, more um, you know, following a different path. Here at the Slade School, he discovered his gift for writing, as you said. Um, was his talent readily apparent in those early works of his, or did it develop over time? Well, it certainly developed, but I think it was apparent early on. They asked him to write um, reviews and criticism, and right away, this extraordinarily vivid style emerged. I think it became clear to him that that was his real gift. He's a delightful artist, not a high-level one. It's more the uh, cartoonist's art or the doodler's, uh, high doodler's art. But he realized here that his real gift was for writing. And I think, yes, even those early notebooks of Chester, you see a wonderfully vivid, um, paradoxical style. At the invitation of one of his Slade School classmates, Chesterton agreed to write some book reviews for a literary journal, and he thereby discovered his true calling. Chesterton was a remarkably perceptive reader and an even more remarkably expressive writer. He began to compose pieces for a number of journals and eventually for the Daily News, writing on Dickens, Blake, Browning, and many other personalities and topics. By the turn of the 20th century, Chesterton was becoming a well-known figure in London literary circles. He was noticed not only for his literary gifts, but for his distinctive look and personality.
I'm sitting in one of the Fleet Street pubs frequented by G.K. Chesterton. It's easy enough to imagine him in this place. He was a tall man, about six foot two, and though in his youth he'd been quite slender, by the time he reached his late 20s, he put on considerable weight. Once he was asked about his size, and he said, well, as to height, I'm six foot two. As to my weight, it's never been successfully calculated. His large head was topped by an unruly mop of curly hair. He loved to wear big coats and capes and floppy hats. I think it's fair to say he was a bit of a character. In 1901, the young Chesterton married Frances Blogg after a five-year courtship and remained completely devoted to her the rest of his life. He later credited her with bringing him back to Anglicanism, which in turn led him to embrace Catholicism. He found his down-to-earth young bride to be a perfect match for his somewhat impractical personality. He was famously absent-minded, once stopping in the middle of a busy London street to consider an argument, while buses, trucks, and cars whirled around him and drivers shouted their dissatisfaction. Another time he was arguing with a woman who apparently finding the discussion tiresome fell sound asleep. Chesterton carried on, asking and answering his own questions. He was constantly getting lost, forgetting appointments, and riding trains to the wrong stations. Once he wired his wife, am at Market Harborough, where ought I to be? One of his famous aphorisms, of course, is that absent-mindedness does not really mean absence of mind, but rather presence of mind elsewhere. What Chesterton's mind was on, increasingly, were religious questions. For he discovered that the classical claims of Christianity corresponded remarkably to the truths of experience. That indeed the very paradoxes inherent in the Christian creedal system corresponded to the paradoxes of life. This kind of thinking led to the writing of the great masterpiece of apologetics known as Orthodoxy. This book appeared in 1908, the same year as Chesterton's best novel, a wild rom called The Man Who Was Thursday, the story of a band of anarchists actually made up entirely of undercover agents. One of Chesterton's great friendships, and he was a man of friendship, was with the Irish dramatist and controversialist George Bernard Shaw. The two men couldn't have been more unalike in appearance and outlook. Chesterton was enormous and Shaw was thin as a rail, Chesterton loved to drink, Shaw was a teetotaler, and yet they bonded very deeply indeed. Across several decades, they argued both publicly and privately about everything, and yet their arguments left both men feeling enlivened. One of their great exchanges, Chesterton to Shaw, to look at you, anyone would think that famine had struck England, Shaw to Chesterton, and to look at you, Chesterton, anyone would think that you've caused it. I'm sure there are some Catholics who would not understand why Chesterton could be friends with George Bernard Shaw, an atheist. What would you say about that? Well, I think it's one of the most attractive uh, things in Chesterton, that he was able to distinguish between ideas and the person. He battled Shaw's ideas like mad. In fact, the two of them debated all over England. Uh, and they would fight tooth and nail, but then afterwards they'd go out carousing together. And so he was able to make that very important distinction between the ideas a, a person holds and the person himself. He loved Shaw and deeply admired him. And I think we need a lot more of that. The trouble is we fall into this uh, personalizing of ideas. If I don't like your ideas, I'll hate you. No, he's a model to me of how to handle them. One of Chesterton's most delightful and enduring contributions to the literature of the 20th century were the Father Brown mysteries. All his life long, Chesterton loved detective stories, and in 1910, he was inspired to compose a tale whose mastermind detective was a nearsighted and mild-mannered priest who managed to solve crimes because of his remarkable insight into human depravity 
derived from years of hearing confessions. As many pointed out, there's a good deal of Chester and himself and Father Brown, especially love for simple and ordinary things, the very things you're likely to overlook because of their insignificance, a useful trait in a detective. Chester wrote Father Brown's stories until 1935, just a year before his death, and they've proven to be the most widely read of all of his writings. Chester made a trip to the United States in 1921. He was a barnstorming lecturer, barreling his way across the country, from New York to Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Albany, Buffalo, Cleveland, Oklahoma City, and St. Louis. He was, by all accounts, a delightful speaker, though people said they were surprised by the somewhat high and piping voice that came out of such a lumbering body. I didn't know what to do. I thought of trying to explain that I was a lecturer, but I wouldn't do because some of them had been to my lecture. after their marriage. Francis and Gilbert vacationed in Beaconsfield, a small town northwest of London. They were so charmed by the village that they decided to make it their home. In 1922, after many years of thought and anguish, Chesterton became a Roman Catholic. When asked to explain his conversion, he remarked, there are 10,000 reasons, all amounting to one reason, that Catholicism is true. Over and against the relativism and subjectivism of the time, he said, it is the only thing that talks as if it were the truth, as if it were a real messenger, refusing to tamper with a real message. Chesterton felt that there was something capacious, roomy, expansive about Catholicism. It didn't take one idea and turn it into a monomania. I'm quoting him now. The church is not a movement, but a meeting place, the trysting place of all the truths in the world. Do you think part of Chesterton's appeal to Catholics is uh, the fact that he converted? Yeah, probably, because people are always intrigued by converts who, in the full maturity of their uh, life, will say, I'm opting for this. So there's something to be said, of course, about coming of age as a Catholic, but when someone um, makes a very conscious, deliberate choice, as Newman did, for example, both Newman and Chesterton are famous converts, there is something intriguing about that. I think, though, too, for Chesterton, it's someone who is wrestling with Catholicism precisely in the context of a skeptical modernity. So he knew all of the Enlightenment skeptical arguments against Christianity, took them on, and with great kind of uh, joie de combat, the great joy of the battle, he entered into, uh, into dialogue with them. I think people find that very attractive, very appealing, too. In 1930, Chesterton undertook another lengthy lecture tour of the United States, covering in the course of many months more than 25 cities. The initial prompt for the visit came from the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana, then best known for its prodigious football team. The fathers of the university had asked Chesterton for a fairly major commitment to function basically as a visiting professor. Chesterton agreed to give 36 lectures on Victorian history and literature, and he gave them right here on the stage of Washington Hall. A 
Upon his arrival to the campus, Chesterton was taken to the football stadium to assist at its dedication. After speeches by the university's president and by Newt Rockne himself, Chesterton was introduced to the crowd, who gave him a standing ovation and commenced rhythmically to chant his name. The great author stayed with a local family in South Bend and then arrived by car every weeknight for the lectures. Because of Chesterton's enormous girth, they say getting out of the car was a lengthy and dramatic business, accompanied by a lot of rocking back and forth. The students would gather around, in fact, to witness the spectacle. And they say when Chesterton managed finally to extricate himself from the car, the students broke into applause, as though for the successful launching of a battleship. At the height of his literary powers, Chesterton produced three truly great books, St. Francis of Assisi, St. Thomas Aquinas, and The Everlasting Man. He also continued to write his weekly column for the Illustrated London News and to edit a journal called GK's Weekly. In the pages of this journal, he developed an economic theory in line with Catholic social doctrine. He called it distributism, identifying it as a tertium quid beyond both capitalism and socialism. Critics say that distributism was never carefully defined in Chesterton's writings, but we can easily enough discern the main features of the program. Distributists were not opposed to private property, just the contrary, but they wanted to see it shared and dispersed as widely as possible. In a word, they were against the concentration of money, property, and power in the hands of a few, and in this, they were deeply in line with Catholic social teaching and out of step with both a socialism that would gather power in the state and capitalism that would gather it in the hands of a few major corporations and economic institutions. One of the marks of the distributists was an affection for the small the local, the homemade. Think here of J.R.R. Tolkien's hobbits, living in their own homes, working with tools that they've made, producing goods and services for their own shire. Think too of the destruction of nature wrought by Saruman in The Lord of the Rings. And you have some idea of what distributors thought about modern industrial capitalism. In the spring of 1936, Chesterton became terribly ill, suffering probably from congestive heart failure. On June the 13th, his great friend, the Irish Dominican preacher, Vincent McNabb, came to visit him. After singing the Salve Regina over him, McNabb picked up Chesterton's pen, which was lying on the bedstand, and he kissed it. The next day, G.K. Chesterton died. He was buried here at Shepherd's Lane Cemetery in Beaconsfield. There are some aspects of Chesterton that would be seen as conservative, and there are some aspects that would be seen as liberal. That must be difficult for people who are strongly one way or the other to accept. And it's one of the great strengths of Chesterton, I love that about him, that conservatives can indeed find lots of things in him that they can embrace. Think of, especially now, in our hyper-secularist time, this robust defense of belief in God and the great traditions of the Catholic Church, all of that conservatives with, you know, in good faith can embrace. At the same time, his distributism, his economic theory, is anything but traditionally conservative. Uh, puts a great stress on uh, the wide distribution of wealth. It's opposed to you know major corporations and a hyper concentration of wealth. So there, a lot of you know more liberally minded people can embrace him. Um, I think both sides can see in this exuberant joyfulness something to embrace. So I like that about him. He's one of these capacious figures that is very roomy. People can find a lot uh, to embrace in Chesterton. Describe where we are now. We are in the library of the uh, Athenaeum Club in the heart of London. And in some ways, you might say the heart of the British uh, establishment. This place was built in 1824. And uh, some of the leading lights in, uh, in British intellectual life were in this room at one time or another. 
everybody from Charles Dickens to Charles Darwin to the painter uh, Turner, uh, up to Toynbee, the historian. T.S. Eliot uh, was in this room, and G.K. Chesterton was a member here at the Athenaeum Club. I just find this room remarkably beautiful, but also it stimulates my imagination to think of all of these famous people in this pretty small space made their way around. Uh, Winston Churchill, much of the British uh, political establishment. Uh, I just i am I'm enjoying the delicious image of G.K. Chesterton sitting in one of these chairs with a cigar and carrying on with Rudyard Kipling, another member of this club. Uh, so it's very moving and, and uh, stimulating to my imagination to be in this room. One of Chesterton's greatest books, and a masterpiece of Christian apologetics, was published in 1908, when its author was only 34. Though he was still 14 years away from his formal conversion to Catholicism, orthodoxy is filled with the Catholic spirit. He begins with a parable of an English yachtsman who lost his way and discovered England, thinking it was a South Sea island. To find the familiar as something strange, to rediscover Christianity as startling and new, is at the heart of his project in orthodoxy. Because people were increasingly uncomfortable with the idea of sin, Chester chose to begin by talking about sanity. Contrary to common perception, the madman, he said, is not someone who's lost his reason. Rather, the madman is someone who's lost everything but his reason. He was characterizing as unhealthy thereby any ideology that would lock us into a narrow and all-explaining system. He was thinking especially of the materialism that was gaining strength at the turn of the 20th century. The view that matter is all that there is. The problem, of course, is that the principle itself cannot be determined through empirical observation and so undermines itself. Moreover, it is a reductionism that leaves aside so much of life, beauty, morality, love, art, and religion. Materialists claim to be infinitely reasonable, but that makes them, Chesterton said, like the coin that is infinitely circular turned in upon itself and turning around and around one dull idea. Chesterton wants to crack open the heads of materialists in order to let in some light and fresh air. Another mark of his time and of ours is a suspicion of tradition. Much of modern politics and philosophy were predicated on a rejection of what came before this cult of novelty amounted, Chesterton felt, to a denial of democracy, for it refused to listen to the voices of the dead. I'm quoting him here. All Democrats object to men being disqualified by the accident of birth. Tradition objects to their being disqualified by the accident of death. Tradition, he famously concluded, is, quote, the democracy of the dead. Chesterton places an emphasis on other ways of knowing other than the scientific. What does that mean? Well, it's a very important point, isn't it? Because one of the marks of modernity is a sort of scientism, which is the reduction of all knowledge to the scientific form of knowledge. There's nothing in the world wrong with the scientific form of knowledge, but it, uh, it corresponds to certain dimensions of reality. However, there are a lot of things that can't be reached by the scientific method. The sciences qua sciences can't tell us anything about why something is beautiful, why something is morally right or wrong. It can't tell us why there's something rather than nothing. What Chesterton would have called mysticism is a, a, a sort of trans scientific, a beyond scientific um, perception. And he resisted with all his power the reduction of knowing to the scientific form. 
He wasn't anti-science, so, so don't fall into that trap. People often do that, oh, religious people are anti-science. He wasn't anti-science, but he knew, as Pascal knew, the heart has its reasons that reason knows not. There are, there's a mode of knowing that goes beyond the scientific mode of knowing. One of the most compelling chapters of orthodoxy is called The Ethics of Elfland. Here he turns David Hume, the notorious skeptic, on his head. Hume would argue that there's no real logical ground for believing in causality, for all we see in nature is succession, but not causal connection. Chesterton thought this was true, but he took it as permission to avoid an oppressive determinism. Though it is necessary that two plus three is equal to five, it is by no means necessary that the sun come up every morning or the trees bear fruit. That these things happen is in fact always a delight and a surprise. One might suppose that a thing repeats itself because it's just a mechanical bit of clockwork. But Chester has said, it might be true that the sun rises regularly because he never gets tired of rising. His routine might be due not to a lifelessness, but to a rush of life. A child kicks his legs rhythmically through excess, not absence of life. Staying with the analogy of a child, a favorite of his, Chesterton observes that just as a child delights in monotony, saying, do it again. So God might say every morning to the sun, do it again, and every evening to the moon, do it again. The regularities of nature are not deterministic recurrence, but in his language, a theatrical encore. And if it is permitted to view the world as magical, then it should be permitted to suppose there's a magician behind it. Or to change the metaphor, if the world is like a story, we must suppose there's a storyteller responsible for it. And this helps to explain, Chesterton felt, the complexity of the church's creeds, something much mocked by moderns. The Christian creed is not a simple and streamlined affair, like the laws of nature, but is rather misshapen, odd, emphasizing one extreme and then another. It is not like a stick that might fit any hole by accident. It is more like a key, uniquely shaped to fit only one lock. When he was a young man, Chesterton tells us, he learned that Christianity was in possession of the very worst vices. The odd thing was they seemed to be mutually exclusive vices. On the one hand, some critics said Christianity was hopelessly pessimistic with its stress on contempt for this world and mortification of the flesh. At the same time, other critics said Christianity was wildly and irresponsibly optimistic with its stress on eternal fulfillment and salvation. The young Chesterton mused, and these are his own words, Christianity could not be at once the black mask on a white world and the white mask on a black world. In a similar way, some critics claim that Christianity was timid, monkish, and unmanly, citing the craven imperatives of the Sermon on the Mount. Think here of Nietzsche's exceptionally harsh characterization. On the other hand, many critics, with the Crusades in mind, attack Christianity for its bloodthirstiness and tendency toward warfare. Chesterton's observation, a thing might have these two opposite vices, but it must be a rather queer thing if it did. Or again, some critics maintain that Christianity was too monkish and austere, characterized by, in his language, 
naked and hungry habits. And other critics held with equal vigor that Christianity is too worldly, what with its pomp and ritual and ostentation. What began to occur to Chesterton was that of all the institutions in the world, Christianity must be the most depraved, the most purely evil. But then an odd alternative came to mind. Perhaps Christianity was not so much oddly shaped as perfectly shaped. And perhaps those whose vision is distorted in various ways see it as alternatively to this and to that. Just as various people might see one and the same man as too fat or too thin, too dark and too fair. Here's how Chesterton sums up the point. Perhaps in short, this extraordinary thing is really the ordinary thing, at least the normal thing, the center. Perhaps after all, it is Christianity that is sane and all of its critics that are mad in various ways. It's exceptionally important at this point to make a clarification. It might seem as though Chester is defending the view that Christianity represents the bland reconciliation of opposing points of view, the moderate middle ground between extremes. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. It struck Chesterton that the great Christian heroes have nothing moderate about them. No one would ever accuse Thomas Aquinas of being moderately intellectual, or Joan of Arc of being somewhat militaristic, or Anthony of the Desert of being mildly committed to the ascetical life. Christianity is not a compromise, but rather a radical and confident putting together of mutually exclusive extremes, one wild excess balancing the other. And Chesterton felt that he had found the ground for this fact at the heart of the Christian creed, where it is boldly affirmed that Jesus Christ is not a demigod, not half human, half divine, not a compromise between divinity and humanity, but fully human and fully divine. Paganism declared that virtue is found on the middle ground, but Christianity declared that it was found in a kind of conflict. Thus the symbol of the cross is especially illuminating, for it represents a collision of opposing forces. A very good example of this principle is the play between affirmation and negation in regard to human beings. No philosophy or ideology has ever thought more highly of human beings than Christianity, which holds out deification as our proper end. At the same time, no philosophy or ideology has ever been more critical of the human project, for none of them can articulate how far we've fallen short of what we are meant to be. And thus, Chesterton said, St. Francis, in praising all good, could be a more shouting optimist than Walt Whitman. And St. Jerome, in shouting all evil, could paint the world blacker than Schopenhauer. In a similar vein, he notices the paradoxical ecclesial attitude toward marriage and children, writing, It is true that the historic church has at once emphasized celibacy and emphasized the family has at once, if one may put it so, been fiercely for having children and fiercely for not having children. In sum, the church has kept opposites, as he put it, side by side, like two strong colors, red and white. It has always had a healthy hatred of pink. As a final example, he gives us St. Thomas Becket, who, quote, wore a hair shirt under his gold and crimson. And there's much to be said for the combination. For Beckett got the benefit of the hair shirt, while the people in the street got the benefit of the crimson and the gold. So briefly, who is David Hume? Well, David Hume was the great 18th century uh, English philosopher, very influential. Uh, one of the most notorious of skeptics in regard to religion. But one of the ideas that Chesterton likes to sort of tweak his nose on is the idea of causality. Because Hume had said there's no, you know, ground for believing in, in causality. 
And so he took that to undermine some of the classical arguments for God. But see, what Chesterton did was very clever. He said, well, no, I agree with you. So maybe causality uh, is not as readily apparent to the senses, but that opens the world up in a certain way. Because in the wake of people like Newton and others in the 18th century, a, a sharp determinism comes to uh, take hold. Things are just set. They're in these absolute systems. And Chesterton sort of found a way in through Hume to say, no, things are maybe a little stranger. They're more uh, elven than you might imagine because things aren't locked in causal um, determinism. So it was a very clever move to take one of the founders of sort of modern skepticism and use them as a wedge to open up room for religion. What about critics of religion who would look at Chesterton's arguments in The Ethics of Elfland and say, well, there you go, here is someone who is looking at scientific phenomena as if it were this magical occurrence. No, in many ways, just the contrary, that he's, um, he's critiquing a, a scientism, you might say, that is all explaining. Chesterton had nothing against the sciences. In fact, he's like Newman that way. He embraced the sciences, loved them. But he didn't like a scientific determinism, which is not science, that's a philosophical point of view, that the only valid way of knowing is the scientific way of knowing. That's what he was opposed to. He wanted to crack open the scientific worldview to let in the light from the supernatural realm. One of his great insights is that it's only mysticism that makes us sane. It's only mysticism that makes us rational in the end. Because a rationalism that's turned in on itself produces a very cramped, closed-in um, worldview. He wanted to crack it open to let in the light. This text, published in 1925, three years after Chesterton's conversion to Rome, is his masterpiece. It is the richest expression of the themes closest to Chesterton's heart. It can legitimately be construed as an answer to H.G. Wells's best-selling The Outline of History, which had appeared in 1920. Wells's argument was that man had gradually evolved from his primitive state to his exalted modern and civilized form. In the process of his evolution, the human being had learned to slough off religion and to embrace modern progress. This fully developed human being would now be in a position to bring peace and prosperity to the world. That such an argument could be made in the immediate wake of World War I struck Chesterton as beyond absurd. The book has two major sections. The first, dealing with the strangeness of man, and the second, with the even greater strangeness of the man called Christ. His target in the first section is the evolutionist, who sees the human being as simply a highly developed animal. Chesterton draws our attention to the mysterious and beautiful prehistoric paintings discovered in caves in the south of France. These are the only real evidence we have, he says, of what, quote, cavemen were like. It shows that human beings did something that no other animal could do, namely produce works of art. Here's Chesterton's language. The higher animals did not draw better and better portraits. The wild horse was not an impressionist and the racehorse a post-impressionist. What the cave paintings reveal is that humans differ from other animals in kind and not merely in degree. Precisely as an artist, a creator, the human can mirror all other things, in some sense containing them all. And in this he's like God, the creator of all. Here Chesterton's driving at something close to Newman's heart, namely that the human being has a kapax day a capacity for God. He's ordered by nature to union with his creator. Or put this in a more biblical language, he's made in the image and likeness of God. It's precisely this kapax, this imago, that suits him to hear the message of the incarnation, that God becomes one of us. 
And the incarnation is the topic of the second major section of the everlasting man called the God in the cave. If Chesterton's interlocutor in the first section was the evolutionist, his conversation partner in the second section is the comparative religionist, the one who would see Christianity as simply one religion among many, and Christ as simply one religious founder among many. Christianity begins, in a sense, with a sublime jest. The infinite and all-powerful God becomes a child born in a cave dug in the earth. Chesterton remarks, the hands that made the sun and the stars were too small to reach the huge heads of the cattle. Upon this paradox, we might almost say upon this jest, all the literature of our faith is founded. No other religion makes a claim anywhere near as radical and strange and wonderful as that. And whether we believe it or not, the very idea of the Incarnation has changed us. When we turn to the figure of Christ presented by the Gospels, we find something unique and startling as well. Though the comparative religionist might suggest that the kind and simple moralist had been turned by centuries of dogma into a fearsome and inhuman character, precisely the reverse is in fact the case. Chesterton argues that the Christ presented in most churches is almost entirely mild and merciful, whereas the real Jesus on display in the Gospels is fierce, often angry, given to puzzling and impenetrable sayings and engaging in acts that confound us. Consider the sayings dealing with non-resistance to evil, which are, as Chesterton put it, rather too pacific for any pacifist. At the same time, the Gospels shed little light on Jesus' attitude toward organized warfare, except, to quote Chesterton again, that he was rather fond of Roman soldiers. The statement that the meek should inherit the earth is anything but a meek statement. His conclusion is the morality we're dealing with in the Gospels is not that of this or any other age, though, to quote him a final time, it might be that of another world. Chesterton suggests that in every Catholic church, right next to the statue of the mild Christ, there should be a statue of the ferocious Christ in full flight of anger. Comparative religionist typically says that Jesus is like Muhammad or the Buddha or Zoroaster or Confucius. But none of those figures ever made a claim about himself even vaguely comparable to the claim that Jesus made about himself. Normally we associate greatness with modesty. The greater the man, the humbler the claims he makes about himself. Concomitantly, the crazier or stupider the man, the more extraordinary claims he makes about himself. Here's Chesterton. Nobody could imagine Aristotle claiming to be the father of gods and men come from the sky. Though you might well imagine one of the insane Roman emperors like Caligula claiming it for him, or more probably for himself. The odd thing about Jesus is that he does indeed say the most extraordinary things about himself. In Chesterton's language, a strolling carpenter's apprentice who said calmly and almost carelessly, like one looking over his shoulder. Before Abraham was, I am. And unless you love me more than your mother and father, more than your very life, you are not worthy of me. The Muslims have a saying, admirable in its clarity, that God is God, and the great man knows he's not God. And the greater he is, the better he knows it. Then there's Jesus, who's quite obviously great and quite obviously sane. 
and yet who speaks and acts in the very person of God. To come to terms with this, as Chesterton puts it, paradox and contradiction is to begin to grasp the nettle of Christianity. The concept of Christianity putting together mutually exclusive extremes is pretty difficult to grasp. Yeah, but it's all the poetry of Christianity. That's what poetry usually does. It usually brings together opposites in this kind of crashing paradoxical way. What Chesterton saw was Christianity rests upon a great poem because it talks about God becoming one of us, the almighty, infinite, eternal God becoming a little baby. In other places, he talks about that even as a jest because a joke is the result of the coming together of incongruous things, right? When things you don't expect suddenly crash together, we laugh, which is why he famously said, we've been laughing at the primal joke of Christianity for the past 2,000 years. Uh, what he appreciates so much in myths and poems and legends, he said, actually happened in Christianity, this great uh, paradoxical coming together. And that's why paradox is so central to all of his writing. All paradox participates in the supreme paradox of the Incarnation. Why is G.K. Chesterton a pivotal player? Christianity has long been haunted by the Gnostic or dualist temptation. This is the tendency to think of Christianity as something joyless, disembodied, purely austere. By the sheer exuberance of his life and writing, Chesterton gives the lie to this sort of Puritanism. He hearkens back to St. Irenaeus. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. Another ancient and persistent danger is a relativism that would turn Jesus into one more inspiring religious founder among many. Along with Athanasius, John Henry Newman, C.S. Lewis, and many others, Chester insisted upon the strangeness and distinctiveness of Jesus. In his own utterly unique voice, he sang the uniqueness of Christ. Thank you. 